Welcome to the Product Design Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Coolen, founder of UX Cabin, where we create world-class web and mobile apps. I'm excited to bring you a behind-the-scenes look into the lives of some of the most interesting and talented people in product design. We'll get strategic advice on how they got to where they are today and things they wish they would have known earlier in their career. Hey, welcome to the Product Design Podcast. Thank you all for joining us today. We got a really great episode coming up for you. We have Peter Loving, founder of User Active, here with us today. We're going to talk freelancing. We're going to talk agency. We're going to talk SaaS. And Peter's got a ton of great experience in the industry, and he's going to be giving us the inside scoop on all things product design, SaaS, all the industry goodies that you all have been uh, wanting to learn more about. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Seth. I'm a fan of the podcast. I'm really happy to be here. Absolutely. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, where you live, and what you do? Okay, so I'm a product designer, and I'm based in Barcelona. I'm from London in the UK. But I moved to Barcelona a few years ago, and I specialize in designing software interfaces. So I mostly work with SaaS companies. Occasionally, I'm designing a brand new product, but probably the majority of my design work is working on an existing product that probably has an old interface or a dated interface, needs some a UI refresh, some UX improvements and some new features released. And I do that work through my agency. I run a small agency called User Active. That's where we do our work of specializing on creating software interfaces that users love. Fantastic. So it has been a journey for you to get to that point. Do you want to give us a little bit of your origin story of how you even got into design in the first place? Yeah, yeah. I think... I've always acknowledged myself as an, as a creative person. So even when I was young, I'd enjoy drawing arts or, or, and music. And when I look back, I, I even remember a time when I was very young at school and with a friend, we started designing trainers, like Nike trainers. And we, we were around seven years old. So we'd be drawing on paper designing. When I look back, I realized that that probably showed that was one of the earliest times where I could pinpoint my interest in design. And that kind of came naturally. And it was something that we were just doing because we were interested in it and we enjoyed it. Throughout education, I, I always art and design related topics, but I also found that I had some interest in some science related uh, stuff. So by the time I got to university, I'd identified that product design was a really good match. I had a friend who'd, who'd gone to universities a few years uh, ahead of me. He decided to do the product design degree. And I, I didn't know what it was at that point. So when I got speaking to him and, and seeing what he was working on, it really clicked. I was like, oh my God, this is the ideal for the kind of the blend of interests I have and the skills I have. It was creative and artistic, yet there was a practical theory behind it. So a uh, scientific engineering theory behind making products. So I studied product design and this degree was consumer products mostly. So we were designing things like interior furniture, interior products, lighting, also consumer gadgets. So things like an MP3 player back at that time when MP3 players were popular, um, radios, television, remote controls, gadgets like that, consumer gadgets that you'd use in the home. And when I finished my degree, I was applying to jobs and getting some opportunities, but the ones that I found for working in a product design team for an industrial design, they were usually jobs where I'd have to relocate to either countries in Europe, but a lot of the jobs were relocating to China or Korea or Japan, places like this. At that particular time, I wanted to stay in London, 
in my very much. And, and there wasn't a lot of product design or industrial product design opportunities sure. there, right? So um, I eventually identified the that the UI UX was becoming popular and web design and how actually traditional product design skills, that toolkit relates and translates really well to the web for digital mm-hmm. design. So my interest kind of translated over to that. And initially I just took a, a graduate job, which wasn't exactly related to design. But in that period of time, I was able to start taking on some extracurricular projects, some some freelance work on evenings or weekends and building up a portfolio. And and eventually I moved over to becoming a web designer. So that, that was nice. how I transitioned, you know, and that's how I got started in, in product design. Yeah, that's interesting. Looking back to school, I don't really feel like in my experience, I was like particularly good at art. Couldn't draw to save my life. Wasn't particularly good at like science or math. And just thinking back, anyone who might be listening, like in product design, there's so many things that like in the career that don't necessarily map to school, right? So like if you're listening and you're like, ah, I could never be a UX designer or product designer because I failed art class or whatever, I would say like, don't write it off completely. It's not a bad thing. There's a lot of different things that you might be able to be good at in product design. So I would say if you feel like you're a creative person, if you feel like you like systems and, and things like that, that's a good base. But don't base your career switch or something like that based off of like if you're bad at math or science or whatever the case may be. Because I found out that I really enjoyed math more when I was getting into career type things. I became like really good at Excel, but in school, totally floundered with it. But I think your origin story is similar to a lot of folks who kind of started out, realized they had this taste of creativity realized that they wanted to make and do things, whatever that meant, use their creative power to not do the same thing over and over and over and be able to really like produce and create things. So that's awesome. I wanted to see over the course of your career, if you have any specific highs or lows that you want to talk about or share with us. Yeah, there have been many. I think that journey, you know, as you just described, there's a lot that goes into becoming a product designer. There are so, there's so many skills and insight that you need to have to, to become a rounded product designer. And in that process, there's a lot to learn. But as you go through the experience of something like freelancing or starting an agency, you have to add to your skill set a lot of business skills, which probably don't come naturally to a creative type of person. And if you've studied creative topics, you, you might not have covered business administration or the business right. side, you know, and so when you get into to freelancing or starting an agency, you're kind of learning these things on the fly. You're learning them on the, on the job. So for me, a lot of the ups and downs highs of lows have been related to that. If I start with the highs, this career has taken me into some really great experiences, designing some things that I I would have never expected to design. So one of them was in my previous agency, we, we were asked to design a, a website, a very interactive website for a charity organization or an NGO that was, that was basically a football academy for African children and it was based in Ghana and what they did was uh, they'd scout across West Africa for children who showed talent in football from around the age of five to eight or nine and they'd offer an academy scholarship to these kids and they'd go and not only would they learn with the the potential opportunity to become professional footballers or soccer as, as you call it over in the States 
they they would also get a first class education, which was an opportunity that a lot of them might not get. So in designing this website, we had to, to showcase all of the footballers, where they'd come from, their stories, and it, with an interactive map of how it moved around. That was a real high point because we traveled over to Ghana and stayed at the academy and got to see how this academy was run and also how talented these kids were and the opportunities that this academy, you know, presented to them. So working on projects like that, another high point was working on uh, a government website in the UK. I actually led, led uh, my agency to, to building the prime minister's website. So that's David Cameron, who was the prime minister in the UK, maybe ar around seven, eight years ago. I'd built his website and then was invited to number 10. So went went to number 10 Downing Street, which is the equivalent of going to the White House and, and meeting the prime minister. So I, I would have never have expected to have that experience through, through getting into web design. Um, How did you get that lead? Yeah. Back in my freelancing days, I was freelancing at one of London's leading PR companies. This was a big PR agency. And, um, the head of digital at this PR agency moved over to uh, the conservative party. So because we had a good relationship, he asked me, you know, Hey, Peter, would you be interested in, in some of the projects that we had have here? So it was just building a relationship over very cool, over a long period of time that led to, you know, that opportunity, which I would have never have expected to do. So yeah, there've been quite a few high points like that. That's very cool. Another one was working on SAS because it really tied back to what I studied at university. So I, I, I studied product design, but once I was, once I became a web designer and I was freelancing in web design, I felt like there was a little disconnect from product, but eventually I got a SAS client and I had to redesign their user interface. And it really clicked with me because it was very much the equivalent of product design that I'd done, studied in university. And it's where that kind of education I'd, I, I had found a grounding in, in digital products. So yeah, working with, with my first few SaaS clients was a real, real high point, real Very high cool. point too. And that led towards forming user active because then I could, you know, specialize in SaaS and um, yeah. that's where I really, you know, refine it. So I'd, I, yeah, I'd describe those as, as high points. And then there've been many lows as well. You know, there've been times where. I'd work for several weeks. You know, I wasn't a very experienced freelancer in the beginning, so I didn't necessarily work with contracts. I'd take jobs that were maybe low quality jobs that weren't very well paid. If I found the, the, the work stimulating or I could see that it would it help me further my freelance career, I, I was very engaged with it. But I, I had times where I'd worked, you know, a couple of weeks on projects and then was never paid for them. <laughs> yeah. I think most freelancers have those experiences, particularly in the, in the early days. I also had experiences where in my previous agency, where we started a big project, I hired developers and that project got canceled fairly, sh you know, soon into the project. So I'd committed a lot of cost of hiring and we put a lot of time, we started building. And the plug was pulled. So I ended up winding down that agency and that was a big low point. That was a big low point for me. So it's all those, I guess the hardships that come along with building a freelance career and building an agency. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot, lots of ups and downs along the way. And I think I've had my fair share of those. How do you pull yourself up from those lows when you're kind of in a low state of something horrible just happened? How do you get out of that? Yeah, that's, that can be pretty, pretty tough. It depends on the, the scale of it. But I think for cases where you have a bad freelance project, being able to wrap up the project, move away from it, try to mentally move on, take a little break if you need to, but look for your next opportunity that will excite you. And that's happened to me before. I've been lucky to find another opportunity or project that I found really stimulating. And that really helped me to kind of forget about a negative experience or a low point. 
and then you know in the future i've often reflected on them and thought okay you know what where did i go wrong with that what did what did i do that contributed towards that situation and how can i avoid it in the future so i think finding something to move on to that that, that is positive and also you know acknowledging areas where you can learn from those i think they, those have been the ways that i've moved on from from low points yeah yeah that's really good i think in every project whether success or fail or any business whether success or fail there's always something to learn there's always something that you could have done better it's it's almost like in in sports right if you do a play or if you're involved in something like there's always something to look back on whether it's film or just talking with your coach that like you got to learn from you got to get better it's the people who say oh it wasn't none of my fault it was just my teammates fault or it was just the client's fault are the people who probably aren't going to see long-term success anyway but it's the people who say like okay i messed up here i learned something here i want to change what i do next time to help give me a slight advantage or help give me an edge that I wasn't aware of. Those are the types of people who are going to be successful in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. It, it's, it's having that mindset of responsibility, of taking responsibility and seeing areas that perhaps was a gap in your skills or yep. that you can improve on. And those are real, real opportunities to grow. And, and if you're, you know, if you're freelancing or, or forming a business, that can happen quite a lot. So, so you get better, better at it as it goes. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk in a little bit about your freelancing career. So I think a lot of people are really hesitant to even consider the idea of freelance because you don't have that stable job. You don't have that. You got to find your work. You got to do all of the administrative costs of running a, a business in addition to being really good at a technical skill. How did you decide to do freelance? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And it's hard for me to even remember. What? How? Oh. Because I didn't have a traditional route into the career of design. I can't, I kind of came into it freelancing and I, I spent a lot of time developing the skill set in my own time as well. So sure. I definitely had design skills from my studies, but, uh, and even in, in that time, Photoshop was the, the main tool for web design. Yes. So this is like some time ago maybe 15, yeah, 15 years ago. And I was already good with that, right? Really good with Photoshop. We used it, you know, every day. So I, I, I skilled up a little bit on my own and I, and I just started to find opportunities. I think I've always been interested in autonomy, being, you know, being an autonomous person and curious too. So the idea of working for different clients and having freedom of the opportunity to do that, that appealed to me. So it seemed natural to, for me to do that rather than to apply for roles. But I think I got the best kind of rounded experience from it because it led to me working in with many different businesses and clients and also within web design agencies. So I definitely got the experience of what it's like to work in a house at an agency too, because I had uh, freelancing tenure as a, a lot of different agencies. So sure. I think it was the range of variety and diversity of, of the projects that appealed to me as well as kind of freedom and autonomy. Sure. Sure. What sort of strategies might you give to folks who are, they're considering, should I go, should I do freelance? Should I continue working my, you know, my normal nine to five job? Can you kind of take someone through how they might evaluate what considerations they need to think about before making the leap? Yeah, I think the key things are having the ability to develop a bit of a network where you can get opportunities to, to have freelance gigs. And obviously you need to develop some kind of uh, portfolio or showcase to present your ability and your skill set. So you usually need to work on that first. And it, and if you don't, so don't quit your job without having anything lined up, right? That's, that's step one. <laughs> get your, get your portfolio website, 
you know, up and running, showcasing the kind of projects that you want to do and your skills in them. If you don't have that, I think, you know, the classic route is getting a few opportunities to uh, work, even if it's pro bono, to get a few projects where you can show that. Um, or even fake projects, I, I would say. Where yeah, they, they seem to work really well as well. I've seen that's really popular with uh, a lot of designers. Even designers that I've hired, I've seen through their portfolio a lot of self uh, initiated projects where they might have redesigned something like Slack and, and let's say, and they're just showing, you know, how we'd tackle it, redesign a Slack. So yeah, they can even get you started. And I think there are two key things besides that I would say to, to focus on. One is the business side of things. It's getting, having a contract, having a, a clearly define how you work, whether that's an hourly rate or a day rate or you want contracts, but it, but, you know, set a, a clear rate and have a contract that you work with. And in the UK, this, uh, it might be different in the States, but in the UK, you have to register yourself as a, a sole trader and you start to do your own taxes, you know, yeah, I probably have a similar system. So yep. I, I would say don't necessarily do that before you start freelancing, focus on getting your freelancing successful and where you're getting projects and you're getting paid and then set that up because yeah. um, there's a bit of administration. And I think sometimes the administration can distract you or scare you off from, you, you know, you want to actually show that you can freelance first. You kind of want to validate that for yourself. Right. And then the key thing is about all about your network and how you find your, your projects. I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. And when I was starting to go out freelancing, so I went freelance and I, there's, I had a handful of other acquaintances or colleagues that were in my network who are kind of going freelance too. And the one thing that like stood out for me that is by far and away, probably like the best thing I did versus like these guys, I think spent a lot, like all of their time on their portfolio and none of their time networking. And what I kind of learned, and I, I did probably like 75% networking, 25% like working on my portfolio. And what I learned from that is people work with who they know, not who they can perceive as best. Me having a portfolio, even if it's worse than someone else's, if I've had lunch with them, if I've had coffee with them, if I have an established relationship with them, I will 99 out of 100 times win the work as long as I don't look substantially worse than them on the technical side. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true because you're, you come up in their mind when they have a requirement because they, exactly. you. and, and they also, they have a good impression of you. They, they know how you are and you've developed a, a relationship. So they think, Hey, Seth, somebody I can trust. He's smart. I think I could really rely on him. And even if your portfolio isn't amazing, I think you, you'd come up in them, their mind. And exactly. having said that, I'm sure, I'm sure your portfolio is, is really great. So having a strong ability to network is just uh, right. going to propel you so, you know, so much. Further. I also think, you know, if we consider the type of, of purchase that someone is, is doing when they engage with us, it's not like they're downloading a $20 ebook where they could read your website and make the decision right there and, you know, not have much risk. This is like a big deal for most people. Like they're investing thousands, tens of thousands of dollars into you as a person because they believe that you can deliver on these things. So your almost it's like your personality or your trustworthiness needs to match your your skill set in the technical world. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think there's a number of ways to build out that, that, that network. The way I did it is by approaching several agencies that you like. Agencies are great to work for as a freelancer because you get to see the work ethic, which I saw the agency work ethic, which was working fast, set a really good pace, lots of different projects, got, got exposure to lots of different types of work, lots of industries too. And also seeing how they manage clients was interesting yeah. for me. So I established relationships with a bunch of agencies in London, and it always meant that 
they'd reach out to me when they had overflow or they exactly had a project and I'd usually be collaborating with that, you know, full-time designers in their team or with developers. And then I also reached out to kind of promote my services independently. And back in, in London in this time, I, I was even putting them in some directories, running a few little ads here and there. So I'd find my own clients and my own leads and also developing relationships in broader agencies that weren't just web design, but these were consultancies like the PR agency that I mentioned earlier. And these businesses always needed designers too. So I think you're um, spot on with that. I, yeah. if you think about it from a freelancing perspective, going to an agency versus trying to go direct client. So if we think about it, agencies have the, the leads, the work. You don't have to find the work. Agencies have the contract set up. They have the billing and the payroll set up. If you work with an agency, you're going to get paid on a regular basis versus a direct client. Maybe it's halfway through or maybe it's at the end. Agencies are typically going to pay you on a whatever time you put into it. So there's less risk, less upside, but but less risk. And they take care of all of the processes, the communication, the client, the, the account management, the project management. And I think freelancers are really, really, really appealing to agencies as well because they can expand their team and contract their team if they've got a healthy bench of freelancers that can jump into projects, jump out of projects, and they don't have to take on the responsibility of hiring a bunch of people for a maybe project or, or whatever. So I think your strategy was exactly my strategy when I started freelancing is to contact agencies for overflow work. And if you get a few agencies that give you fairly regular work, all you need are two or three agencies and you're off to the races. Yeah. I think you can have your, you know, full-time schedule booked up with, with, a very small number of agencies and it's great for the exposure because you meet people, you work on very different projects and yep. you've kind of cut your teeth in design because you learn a lot very fast. That's how yeah. I experienced it. <laughs> and once you get the ball rolling, I, th I think it generally snowballs. Another thing that worked really well for me, which is probably, it might be a little bit harder now. I'm not sure, but I got myself a desk in a co-work office, co-working oh, nice. office. And uh, I moved around in co-working a little bit just because I also moved, moved in London a couple of times. And when I was working in a co-work and designing, I obviously had a big iMac on my desk and people would see that. It became very common for people to, to start talking to me and find out what I do and, and build context. And I'd get asked, so many times to, to work for the different companies or help out in these different areas. So that's um, super interesting. Yeah, no, I didn't expect it, but there were a couple of busy co-works in London in my early freelancing days where I almost had to move out of them because it was just overwhelming the amount of, you know, these are, <laughs> these are tech startups that desperately needed, you know, good designers. So when they, they see me working right there, they just, I was like, I couldn't get any work done. I was getting distracted so much. So yes, I think that m might be a little bit harder now, but I think there's an, like a digital equivalent to doing that these days. So it's like rubbing shoulders with people is always fantastic, whether it's at a co-working space, coffee shop, or just people that you're working with at an agency. It's people who work at an agency. What do they do usually within five years? They go work at another agency or get promoted to another company. And just like your friend who went to work in the government, they, they pull in their friends to, to do work with them. So I think if we're trying to think about how to recreate kind of this co-working space, one thing that I've seen people do really successfully is like do their work and share it on Twitter or LinkedIn, or just talk about it or, you know, put it on dribble. And that kind of it gets more eyeballs on it than, than not doing anything at all. And you get the right eyeballs on it. And same thing, tech startups see it, agencies see it, whatever. 
Yeah, I think that's the equivalent of pre-COVID days when you're working in a co-work office and people walk past your screen and see that you're working in Figma and they go, oh, there's a UI designer. Hey, we we need one. We might we might fit them. <laughs> <laughs> and that would happen to me so much because they'd see they'd literally see my design work because they look at the screen as they will buy. Right. And that's kind of like what you can do with with a LinkedIn. It, it goes past their feed, and they just they might get a glimpse. But once once they get familiar with you sharing design work and, and great you know UI that stands out, then then yeah. I mean, I've had leads that way as well through through the social platforms yeah yeah be interested to see if you had any luck doing kind of like cold outreach or ads that someone clicked on and then someone who knew you as a designer first and then came to like know you personally and then give you work like how did that approach work for you in the early days i had some leads that would that i could generate from there there was a an advertising website called gumtree so i thought oh i'll try it there because there are services there. it was super cheap and it actually worked like i'd get i'd get people contacting me through that but i would say looking back at those leads it was the beginning of my freelancing day so i was trying many things and um they weren't high quality. They were, they were usually small businesses that maybe they didn't have a lot of money to spend, but they had projects and it was a great way to get started. Yeah. Um, but since then, I haven't really tried ads too much because I didn't really need them. I think it is harder. It's definitely harder with ads from a cold lead and you can get yeah. lots of inquiries that are not quite what you're looking for. But one thing that has worked very well for me is that I think building a community works very well. So I built a a Facebook group, which is a community for software founders. It's called SaaS Founders Build and Scale Facebook group. And actually, because I manage and curate the content in that group, I've built up a lot of uh, relationships through doing that. And uh, nice. also I've, I've found clients through running that group. So... You know, now, I mean, that was some years ago that I started that and maybe Facebook might not be the most engaging platform going forward. But if, if you have the interest and the opportunity to build a, a community on a platform that you really identify with, even if it's an Instagram account that's just very much focused on UI, UX design. Yeah. And you build a following. I think there's a lot of value in, do, in doing that. I think you can generate awareness of who you are, what yeah. you do, and, and, and it's a good way to, to invest. Agreed. In I think that's what, you know, kind of my approach to this podcast is like just sharing things, bringing awareness, talking to cool people. And that's actually how we met because you, yeah. you know, became aware of the podcast and we got connected through that, which is kind of like, uh, a sense of building a, a community that is starting to expand its reach. Yeah, I love that. You start something like the podcast and you don't necessarily know what opportunities it will throw up, but the more that you do the podcast, the more you publish and over time, it's content that's always going to stay there and the results get, you know, snowballing over time. It might right. feel like it takes a very long time in the beginning because it is a lot of work and effort. But I, I think it definitely broadens your network, gets you meeting interesting people and builds opportunities in the long yeah. run. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth, it's worth the effort. I think what you're doing with this, this podcast is really great. Yeah. Thank you. One thing that just kind of popped into my head as we were talking about like cold outreach or having relationships bring you into things. I think there is a way for a freelancer to get really good, like cold lead projects. But I think in order to do that, you have to have really tightly defined productized services. So instead of just presenting yourself as a, a freelance UI UX designer, I think you have to define really specialized products that you offer. So for example, if you say like, okay, I have a style guide, I will take whatever your existing site is and make a style guide. Here's an example. Here's what you get. Here's the deliverables. Here's the price, you know, $1,500, whatever. Someone can read that, not know who you are and understand like 
the quality that they're going to get and the deliverable that they're going to get. But if you're just presenting yourself as a general person who works on things, yeah, you really have to rely on your personality, your network, your your ability to meet with people and kind of sell yourself. So I think those could be two separate strategies that a freelancer could use depending on the the type of work they want to go after. Yeah, I, I think the the productized approach is really, really great. If you're quite focused on what you do and you know there's a service you can deliver and you can package it, then it's really fantastic and you've got a repeatable thing that you can promote that. Uh, I definitely think the productized approach has, has grown in popularity over recent years and it's just a great way to kind of apply business principles to what you're doing as a freelancer. It also helps you to scale a bit more easily because this is a repeatable process. You get familiar with it and you can, you can get more f- faster and efficient at doing it. I think that's a, another great route. Another great. Route. Yeah. So you haven't stayed a freelancer. You've obviously gone and built agencies and grown a team. What are some of the, the decision points where you're like, should I just stay solo and just stay on my own? Or should I try to hire someone or bring on a team or bring in other contractors? What goes through your mind when you're considering those type of opportunities? But yeah, I think in the beginning, it was almost accidental because I think if freelancing, if you try to succeed at it for a long time, which I think it can take a while for many people to succeed in that transition into becoming a freelancer and you do it for an extended period of time. The natural next stage is that you become successful as a freelancer. So you become busy and you get to the point where you're getting way more offers for projects than you have time to actually deliver. Yep. And I was getting bigger projects. I got involved in a few projects that would be, that would require a small team. And there were a couple of occasions where either someone I knew or myself had had put together a small team to deliver a project for a client because it might have much more work than one person could do or a range of skills. Like it might have needed a designer and a developer or a certain kind of developer. And I started to operate that way. And as these projects got bigger and opportunities grew, I was always somebody who wanted to take on each project. I didn't like that feeling of saying no to a project. And, yes. <laughs> and accidentally, I mean, that can be a bad thing, actually. It can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. But uh, it, it kind of accidentally happened where I was saying, oh, yeah, I can do this. We can do this. And I'd just assemble little groups to deliver them as and when. And it led towards, um, you know, forming an agency brand and putting a website and hiring. So yeah, I have subsequently discovered through agency coaching groups that this is the typical way that agencies are formed. It's very, this is, a, this is exactly how UX Cabin was formed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's the most common way. There's an agency coach that, that I know called Jason Swink. And he says that nearly all agency owners are accidental agency owners because they went through their freelancing. They were good at what they did. It snowballed. And then they ended up running an agency. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of really poorly run agencies out there, as I'm sure you've, maybe you've worked with only good agencies, but it's cool to be able to work with a lot of agencies because then you get to see like what you like, what you don't like, how you want to run things if you ever get to that point. And there's a lot of different philosophies on how to do or not do things that it's really beneficial to kind of get a glimpse into how other people do it before you do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really beneficial because when you, if you find yourself starting to run an agency or going that direction, you suddenly realize how much there is to learn and how much there is to adjust to do that successfully, because it's really difficult running an agency. And the skill set is different too, because you start stepping away from being uh, somebody in the service delivery to managing projects and and client relationships and selling yep. projects and delivering those projects so and also managing managing teams uh managing yeah, them know. and 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 making sure that what's delivered f- fills the vision of what that that client brief or that project was all about so 
there's a lot of learning to do if, if you get to that transition. And it's kind of like when you become a freelancer, but I would say it, the, the learnings are steeper and there are more of them because <laughs> the magnitude is that much bigger, right? Yeah. The stakes get higher, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in an agency, there's the X factor of people that you have to motivate to do things at a certain time and rhythm and all that goes along with that. How do you work with a team to motivate them, to make sure they're working well together, to manage all of that? Yeah, that's an interesting one. What I've learned from my experiences are that generally talented people are motivated by projects that they're excited to work on and also working with other talented people. So I think fundamentally the work that the agency does has to be appealing. So if you can focus your agency on a certain type of work that also attracts designers, I, I work with designers, we exclusively do design. So I have to find projects that I know would be engaging and stimulating for, for me to work on. If I'm excited about a project, that's a really good sign that other designers will be excited about that project too. I like product design problems, designing software interfaces where we have to solve a usability issue or design a flow to do something in a better way. So when I see people who also kind of share that interest or have an enthusiasm for solving these kind of problems, you can usually see a spark of interest, then I know that they're a good fit. And, you know, if we're always focusing on the same thing, then it becomes reliable that, okay, does product designers who like solving usability issues, designing flows and, and making products easier and more enjoyable to use, they will usually enjoy working at user active because we, that's all we do. Whereas previously in my previous agency, we were kind of like a full house agency. So we do everything for everyone, a full service agency. And yeah. And so every project was different. So you can't get a reliable set of criteria that, you, you know, other people right. like, you, you know, are excited to work for or look <laughs> So that's the good thing about focusing on one thing or productizing, because you, you can also attract people that want to work on that thing. Right. Um, and the other thing is for me, it's, I haven't always been great at hiring, but one thing I've learned is that if, if I hire people that I'm excited to work with, of course, there's a lot of criteria in making a good hire, but if they excite me to work with them, it's a really good sign because it means that there's somebody who I know is very talented, very smart, excited about the same kind of stuff that I am. And generally the other side of things takes care of itself in a way. I know that, I know that they'll be motivated and then, you know, hopefully those things, uh, that's the foundation of what builds a, you know, a good. Yeah. I think one thing for me that I'm put forth as like my like principle in running a company is that like most business problems are people problems. And if you can take care of your people, they will take care of most of the business problems, like the bigger, hairier ones, right? So I think back to like the times where I've worked at companies or with companies or at, at agencies. And I think of the times where I like really went above and beyond and I kind of stuck my neck out or did a thing or worked a weekend or whatever. And looking back, me like, man, it would have been really nice if, you know, the CEO or my manager would have like come over to me and like thanked me or shared some like appreciation for me or whatever with the team and get some sort of like recognition. And it's like, huh, that didn't happen. And yeah, then it's like, maybe it doesn't really matter if I go above and beyond, or maybe it's not noticed or appreciated. And I think doing those sort of things with your team, whether they're full-time, whether they're contractors, but just showing like, you know, really genuine appreciation for folks when they do those things above and beyond really goes a long way because it builds a culture of gratefulness or appreciation. So then when you have to have the hard conversations of like, ah, you messed up here, it's like, they're not only getting that they're getting, you know, 
I get appreciated, I get recognized, but I'm also, you know, held accountable for the things when I do mess up. And I think that's one way of building up a team that a lot of, that's really easy to do, honestly, but like really rare in most companies, in my opinion. Yeah, I I think there's a, a real balance. It's a real skill to be able to motivate, show appreciation and gratitude. Also to have those conversations where maybe somebody isn't applying themselves as much as you know they can or they're not motivated and you have to try to understand if there's an issue, what that issue is. Is there anything that I can do to help with this issue? Or is there a potential that this person isn't a fit? And there's a lot that can go on in those kind of situations. There's a lot of nuances too. So I think managing people is a skill that there's a lot of information about, but it's a skill that, you know, because I've read books about how to apply good management styles and and techniques, but I think that it's a skill that develops over time. You know, for me, it's been many years of managing designers now. I think I I can really see that I've improved a lot since the first time I was managing designers. I think it's like any of these skills that have a lot that goes into them, it takes time and experience as well as all of the theoretical side of learning how to do it. And I think also guidance too, coaching or having a really good manager show you what it's like to have a, have a good, a really good manager experiencing that is, is something to learn from too. So. Yeah. I mean, this is, it's what, it's one of those areas where when you move into an agency, this is just one thing. It's a great, great big thing, uh, but that's just one of, one of many. So yeah, it does, in order of magnitude, it does become a lot more difficult running an agency. Yeah. So, you, you know, we talked to kind of about managing people a little bit about hiring. What do you look for in designers that you're looking to bring onto your team? What helps people stand out to you? So the first thing is obviously the way they present themselves and uh, their work. I'm usually looking for quite a specific type of designer, so I, it, it, it helps the criteria quite fine. I need to see experience in product design and software. And what I'm looking for is somebody who, you know, I mentioned earlier that there are t- two sides that make up usually a great product designer, and that's the artistic side, and then the, also the scientific or mathematical yep. side, as you will. I'm looking for somebody who who has a good grasp on both of those. So not only can they lay out UI with really good color theory, use of uh, typography, space, spatial awareness, ability to design things in a well-formed grid, a layout that looks orderly, logical, clean, and easy to take in if, if you, you know, imagine a user looking at it. So all of those, which could almost be, des- almost be compared to like a graphic designer, an artistic flair, coupled with, with the technical skill of knowing when to use different elements, how to design specific interactions, what happens when you click on a certain button, what the next state would be. Does that have validation in it? Is there a success or an error message? And how do the options change for any variable of where the user clicks or what they interact with? So what that comes down to for me is, is two things. There's one is a technical understanding of web interfaces, whether that's form fields, drop downs, check boxes, radio buttons, all of your classic HTML elements. It's that technical understanding of when and where to use elements. And then the other part of that is somebody who can demonstrate a skill in problem solving, which is what I think the majority of product design is. It's something like, oh, this, this user needs to be able to go into their CRM add a new contact quickly and easily, and then schedule a call with that contact, and then maybe log some information. That might be a flow where you you look at an existing software that's old and it's a bit clunky. And the problem is how do we, you know, make that flow more intuitive, make it easier to do, make it faster and make it require less brain power on the users. Right. So, you know, I imagine some of the problems that we have in our own in-house projects or or, uh, projects that we're doing for our clients 
And I like to think, if I put this designer on that problem, would I be really confident that they could solve it? Have they demonstrated that ability to uh, remove complexity in design where you can flow and solve a, solve a usability problem? Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. So we're here kind of at the the conclusion of our, our podcast. Wanted to give one last opportunity for you to give any last piece of advice to any aspiring product designers as they're trying to find their way before we close off today. I think some good advice that would have also helped me, you know, earlier on in my career that, that I think could be beneficial to anyone listening is try to, to get really clear on a vision of what it is you're looking for, where you want to work, how you want your career to look. Because product design is very broad. There are a lot of disciplines within it. Even the categories from UX research, you can go right into that and just be working exclusively with UX research. So if you take the time to get really clear, it will definitely help you in getting to getting to that place. I mean, it sounds quite general, but I think it's really important because there's a lot to think about. Do you want to work in a product company? Do you want to freelance? Would you, do you like the idea of agencies? Yeah, now, which discipline to? So sometimes you might need a bit of experience to get a taste of each of these different areas. And it's good to go out and get that. But when, when you feel you have that, try and work on getting clarity for yourself and, and trying to commit into a specific area that makes you unique and makes you different, but also will give you the ability to get what you'd like out of your career or, or your work. Awesome. Well, Peter, thank you so much. It's been a great time chatting with you and really cool to see all the overlap between some of our career journeys. And thank you for everything that you shared with us today. Hey, Seth, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me on. Really, really enjoyed our chat. And uh, yeah, like you said, it looks like we, we've got a lot in common with our kind of backgrounds and also what we're doing now. So it's always nice to talk to someone where you, where you share a lot uh, with them too. So yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, man. We'll have you again on sometime. Great. Look forward to it. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today on the Product Design Podcast. If you enjoyed our conversation, be sure and go follow our guests. Let them know they did a great job and you learned a lot. Um, more to come in the following weeks as we bring on new guests. Please hit that subscribe button so that you will get these podcasts uh, and learn a ton about the product design community. Excited to see you next time. Thanks.